station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready. NASA, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Uh, on our muscles and, and on our bones. So uh, I'm interested in knowing how they remain fit during the time that they're up there. All right. Mark, looks like we got Peggy and Shane on the screen. So uh, let's see. Peggy, Shane, can you hear us? We hear you loud and clear. Thanks for joining us here at the Aviation Summit. We appreciate what you guys are doing up there. We're going to moderate a little question and answer here with Mark Garneau and Kara Hallett from the U.S. Chamber. I think you guys may know Mark. And uh, so I'm going to turn the first question over to Mark. And uh, again, thanks for being here with us. Mark? Thank you, Robert. And uh, very nice to talk to you, uh, Shane and Peg. Uh, a real treat for me. And uh, my question is that my experience was only 10-day missions. Uh, you, on the other hand, are on missions the last many, many months, and we've talked about the concern uh, with respect to what happens to the human body. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how do you maintain fitness up there? How do you look after your nutrition? Well, they have us on a pretty strict exercise regimen. Uh, we're working out about two to two and a half hours every day. Uh, about an hour of that is cardio. We have a treadmill and a stationary bike to do that. And then we have a, a resistive machine for our weightlifting, um, so-called weightlifting. But it, it's a really incredible machine called A-RED. Um, and you can get some really heavy loads, but you can do anything you can do on Earth pretty much. Squats, bench press, shoulder press, um, curls, triceps, sit-ups. So it's really a nice machine, and it's keeping our bones and our muscles uh, healthy. Uh, along with that is nutrition. And we, so we all have a certain uh, calorie amount we're trying to meet every day. Um, to keep our bones and our, and, our, and our mass up. We don't want to lose a lot of weight up here because that will affect our bone loss. So uh, we try to keep our weight um, stable, and most of us up here on this expedition anyway have, have been very stable, so it's been nice. Carol, thank you. Shane, as a pilot, was that helpful to you in becoming an astronaut? And tell us about it. Well, it's, I think it's helpful just as a mindset and being operationally oriented, which is uh, what I really gained from being a pilot in the, in the military. Um, I'm not flying this spaceship. I didn't fly the space shuttle, so I wasn't using pilot skills per se. But you do use uh, teamwork, of course, and being on a crew and knowing what it's like and, and relying on the person next to you to potentially save your life. So those kind of things are uh, things that I gained from being a pilot. So, Peggy, you're part of Expedition 50. You've been part of other missions, expeditions as well. Tell me what that means and, and tell me what you've seen different over the course of your uh, different trips to the station. Actually, we uh, have six-person crew now, which is uh, different from when I flew before. It was before just a three-person crew. Uh, and we come up and down on the Soyuzes, and the Soyuzes have a three- to four-month overlap on the rotation. So halfway through the expedition, um, you know, Shane will go home, and uh, we'll continue to stay up here for another the, the folks that arrived with me on, on uh, our Soyuz will stay another few months after that. And so because of that overlap, we have a, kind of a changeover halfway through the mission. So it's interesting dynamic. Uh, I had changes of a single in, uh, crew member out of uh, three during when we were still rotating on the shuttles. And uh, it was interesting to, for the psychological dynamic of how one person can change the group dynamic. It, I found it very interesting. So I'm sure that the dynamic will change a little bit with different people, a whole new crew of three or two, I guess, as the case will be for us after uh, Shane's crew leaves. Uh, I think the biggest differences, um, you know, obviously the station has gotten bigger. Uh, it's uh, an amazing engineering miracle, I think, that, that we uh, can live up here and work up here and do so many different types of research. Uh, I think it's very exciting to be here now uh, because of that. Well, uh, talking about research, uh, we're watching the two of you, and of course we can see all sorts of wires behind you. It looks like a, a big uh, research or scientific lab, and one of the important things that you are doing up there, of course, is performing science. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the kinds of scientific experiments that, uh, that you're performing these days. 
Okay, well, Peggy's the, certainly the real scientist out of the group, so I'll, I'll let her answer most of this. But I've had, I've had a lot of fun learning how to do science at you know, things I'd never done before. We've done capillary flow experiments. I was able to grow some lettuce um, as part of an experiment up here, so that was really great. We got to eat fresh, fresh vegetables up here on orbit, which is very rare. So those have been a few of the fun things I've gotten to do. My favorite experiment right now is the stem cell culture uh, that we're doing here on, on orbit. It's the first time we've tried to grow stem cells up here, and uh, they seem to be doing quite well. So we're very excited to see the end result, um, and we'll be doing another round of fixations in the next couple of days. So I'm looking forward to that. I, we also do some really interesting things in combustions uh, and fluids. Uh, because of micro, in microgravity, fluids uh, don't work exactly the same way. So it's an, actually an interesting uh, to study how those fluids work. And so we have uh, one experiment called packed bed reactors, which is looking at how hydrophilic and hydrophobic columns can change how you separate gas-liquid mixtures and uh, which is going to be important, obviously, in development of new technologies that require liquid gas separations and in uh, engine development uh, for future exploration. So it's really a lot of fun to be a part of all of this. Thank you. So Peggy and Shane, both of you, because you may have different duties, tell us about a typical day in space. And if it's the same, you two can choose who will answer. Otherwise, please tell all of us. Okay, very good question. Uh, typical day, we get up at about six in the morning and uh, we'll start our day working around 7.30 and we end our day at 7.30. So we have about a 12 hour work day. Um, in that 12 hours, we have a couple hours of exercise, like I mentioned, and a meal built in uh, the middle of the day. Uh, besides that, we're all usually doing different things throughout the day. Uh, the last few days, Peggy and I have had the chance to work together on a really big project, our carbon dioxide removal assembly. We had to take that apart and uh, put, a new, put it back together pretty much. It's like taking a, an aircraft engine apart and reassembling it. So we got to do that over the last few days. But in general, we're working separately on different experiments or different maintenance tasks and uh, whatever the schedule calls for um, that day. We kind of generally have an idea of the week, what we're going to do you know, for the whole week, and then we, you know, things will change here and there based on either things that happened or didn't happen throughout the week. I think one of the neat things about the working up here is that every day is different. Uh, some days we're focused, like Shane said, we've been doing ma a lot of maintenance the last couple of days. The couple of days before that, we were just full up on science. Um, so I like the variety, the diversity of the different types of things that we do. I think it's a lot of fun, makes it interesting. So can you guys share with me a little bit of the, the role of the private sector and what you're seeing on station and in our space-based research? Well, CASIS is a, an organization that's trying to get private uh, space-based research up here. And actually the stem cell experiment that I'm looking at is one of the, an example of one of those. Uh, I don't know the details on all of the examples, but I know on previous expeditions I've also done commercial, uh, uh, I grew soybeans, for instance, for a seed, co a seed uh, company. Um, so we've done it in the past. I think CASIS uh, is our, our mechanism now of trying to organize that uh, research to get it on board more quickly. Um, and expedite the, the volume of research that we're doing up here. Uh, well, as a, as a Canadian, I obviously have to ask a question about robotics, and so I was just wondering if uh, either of you have uh, had the uh, opportunity or the need to use uh, the robotics on board the station and, and for what kinds of tasks? Yeah, the uh, robotic arm has been very busy uh, since we've been up here, really, our whole expedition. It's been crazy. We had a few spacewalks in January um, where we replaced new batteries on the outside of the station. And the week leading up to those operations, the robotic arm was busy actually removing and replacing some of those batteries for us to just get it in a better position for us. So um, it was very busy with that. Uh, we've had three visiting vehicles show up since I've been here. 
the Cygnus orbital uh, vehicle, SpaceX, and the HTV. So we've obviously used the robotic arm to grab those vehicles when they when they arrived. So that's it's been a lot of fun. The robotic arm has worked in, incredibly well. Uh, the uh, SPDM, um, an attachment that, that we use sometimes on the end of the arm, has worked amazingly well, um, with all, especially with all those batteries that we had to uh, rearrange on the outside. So tell us about supplies. How often do they come? What kind do you get? And how are they uh, sent to you? Well, the cargo ships come up to us. Uh, it's actually pretty varied, but last week we had two. That's kind of unique. Uh, typically, they're two to three months apart, um, and it just depends on the schedule. Because we have commercial providers providing those vehicles, uh, they have kind of their own schedule and their own grouping, and we get an HTV about once a year. Progress is about three a year, and then Orbital and Cygnus, somewhere between... Uh, three and four times a year. Yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, people often ask me about is uh, this, the International Space Station uh, is performing uh, uh, some very important work. Is any of it leading towards future missions beyond low Earth orbit? That's a question that often comes up. I was wondering if you could tell us whether some of the work that you are doing will help us one day to go beyond low Earth orbit. Well, obviously, understanding the human body and the effects on the human body, we're doing some very detailed investigations looking at the uh, fluid shifts and how that has the potential uh, to help us understand whether or not that's affecting the astronaut vision. Uh, we are doing studies, uh, uh, some of them done by the ground teams, looking at uh, different things, different materials that we can be using uh, outside on the surfaces of our spacecraft. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, fluid studies, you know, looking at gas uh, liquid separations, uh, which is important in uh, engine development for future missions, potentially, or other systems internally within the vehicle. So it's actually very exciting to be a part of this, and I think actually you know, 17 years of this orbiting uh, station uh, provides us every day some new engineering opportunities. Our, our ground teams are learning a lot operationally as well about how to do things the best way. Um, so I think every day is a learning experience for us and it's not only scientific but all the technology that we're developing and testing, that's probably the most important thing is testing those things uh, out before we go beyond low Earth orbit. Here we can get resupplies, and once we start those long duration missions, the capability of getting resupplies will be much more difficult. So we have little experiments looking, for instance, at manufacturing things in space. Um, and so we've been building small parts and tools and uh, testing them, and they'll be doing continuing further research when we bring those items back to the ground, studying their uh, tensile strength, et cetera. So you guys mentioned that, that obviously it's the International Space Station, right? And our station partners have all agreed to support the station until 2024. Um, why is that important to you guys? And, and as you said, remind us again who the partners are and who's up there with you. You said there's six folks. Who's, who's on the station with you? Okay, I'll start with our crew. We have three cosmonauts from Russia. We have a French astronaut and Peggy and myself. So that makes up the six. Um, the, the big players, I think, in the, the space game, the Canadian Space Agency, JAXA from Japan, the European Space Agency, the, the Russian side and the American side are the, are the big players. And I'm sure there's other, other countries involved, but those are the, the five big ones that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, I think it's very important we all work together. I don't think any one of our countries could do any of this kind of exploration in this day and time alone. Uh, and I think we're really a great model for society in general that shows what we can do when we all work together. So thinking back to the first time that you each went into space and looked back at the Earth, what were your thoughts then and what are they today? Well, my first flight about eight years ago was, uh, I was just, I was smiling from ear to ear, just looking at our beautiful planet, just in awe. Uh, and today I've had a little more time, you know, on this mission, I've been up here a little over four and a half months now, I think. 
and I've had more time, obviously, to look out the window and look at our planet, and it's just incredibly humbling to me to look at it and see how beautiful and spectacular it is, but also see, you know, the thin layer of atmosphere that protects all of us on Earth from living and dying. So it's, to me, it's very humbling. And I, I had many of the same sensations as Shane, and this is my third long duration space flight, and I still tend to smile ear to ear. <laughs> it doesn't go away. <laughs> it, is, it is an amazing experience, and I think it, it really does make us uh, value the fragility of our planet and uh, and the the fact that uh, that I really appreciate the fact that we're doing this as a as a world team. Thank you very much. I have to say, I'm curious. How did that lettuce taste? It was outstanding. <laughs> 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 All right, so we're, we're about coming to the end here. So what I do, I, question for you guys, what's the uh, first thing you plan to do when you get back home? Well, let's, uh, let's see. I've got about five more weeks left before I head home in early April, and uh, I just really want to relax and spend time with my family and friends that I've been away from for so long. Yeah, I think we're going to be doing a lot of science data collection <laughs> the first few weeks, but uh, I, I agree. I think spending time with family is going to be the important part. All right, one more question, Mark. You got one more? No, I just wanted to say a, a real thrill. Uh, I remember, uh, Peggy, we, we worked together in the 90s, and uh, Shane, you arrived the year I left. Uh, it's great to uh, have an opportunity, a real privilege to speak to you. All right, so Shane, Peg, thank you so much for everything. We appreciate what you're doing up there, and thanks for your time and being part of this, the Aviation Summit here in Washington, D.C. Appreciate it, guys. Enjoy it. <laughs> Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. Okay, folks, thank you very much for your patience through that, and have a great summit. Thank you, all participants from Washington, D.C. Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.